Hello everyone, I'm Theo Hartzell. In today's video, we're going to cover the topic of are people today required to keep the law, whether for salvation, requirement, or recommendation. It will address it all. In speaking of are we required to keep the law, what law are we talking about? The scope of this video will include all the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the whole Torah, Torah, depending on your pronunciation. That means we will also be covering the Ten Commandments and the 613 commandments of the law of Moses. That also means by extension, this will answer the question, am I required today to keep the feast and the festival days? Am I required to keep Sabbath and Sabbath days? Am I required to keep kosher food laws of clean and unclean foods? And there's certain foods that I'm not allowed to eat. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6 and 7 gives us a tremendous theological amazing story. And he uses an analogy of a woman that is trying to have two husbands and if she's trying to be married to both of them at the same time, she's actually committing adultery because she's trying to be married or live with them and have a relationship with both of them at the same time. Then he turns right around and says, oh, by the way, you are the woman. One man is the law and the other man is Jesus Christ, which means, depending on what this story means, you better be careful because you could actually be trying to keep the law and be living in adultery against your husband, Jesus Christ. You do not want to miss this video. You need to watch this and stay with me to the very end because I'm going to address so many things that you probably have questions about. With that being said, Let's just turn to Romans chapter 7, and we'll start at verse 1 to get started. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, or basically however, however, if while her husband liveth, she is married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, Ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. All right, now I'm going to put some pictures and illustration up here on the screen to help explain what the Apostle Paul is saying. Now, let me give you a couple of different scenarios to make this practical to us. But let's say that there's this girl, and we'll name her Sally. And she has grown up with a friend of her named Bill. He's very dependable. He's hardworking. He's dedicated. And as they grow older, she's looking at marrying him. And she thinks, well, he is very stable. He's dependable. He's hardworking. He's supportive. He'll always be there. And they end up getting married. Well, in the process of that, she ends up figuring out that there's a whole different side of Bill that she didn't realize. She finds out the longer they've been married that he's very aggressive. He's very angry. He's unmerciful. He's unforgiving. He has tons and tons of rules and regulations that she has to keep. And if she doesn't keep them, then he gets very angry and manipulative and controlling with her. And she feels the longer she's married to him, she is suffocating more and more and more. 
And she becomes very dissatisfied in this relationship because she is never able to live up to Bill's expectation. And in this process of being unhappy, she ends up meeting another man named John. And John is like the polar opposite. He's very loving, very kind, very supportive, very forgiving. And so he is talking to Sally and they figure out they love each other. They want to get married. And Sally is wanting to just get into a physical relationship with him. And he's like, no, it doesn't work that way. We're going to do it the right way before God. Man, we're going to get married. So Sally ends up marrying John. And they get married and they have a physical relationship together. And they are husband and wife for all intents and purposes, including the physical relationship. There's only a huge problem. And that is she is still legally married to Bill. And she was married to Bill first. Now, if she is married to John and married to Bill at the exact same time, that's what the Apostle Paul is saying, that she is an adulteress because she's bound to the law of marriage to Bill, and now she's running over and trying to be married to John at the exact same time, and she is called an adulteress because she's living in adultery. How does that relate to you? Because the analogy that the Apostle Paul gives drives home in verse 4 is that you are the woman. And Bill, the first husband, is the law. And John, the second husband, is actually Jesus Christ. And Paul's whole point is that if you are trying to be married to the law at the exact same time you are trying to be married to Jesus, you are in spiritual adultery. Now, let me give you a second scenario. There's this girl named Sally. She's gone to school with Bill and known Bill all his life. He is a hardworking, dedicated man. And there's another side to him that she doesn't realize when they get married and we go through the same exact scenario. However, one day on his way to work, he actually gets killed in a car wreck. And now that law of marriage that they had between them is no longer applicable because he has now died. They are no longer married. She is now a widow. She is no longer married. He has died, been buried. Sure, she's heartbroken. Sure, she's grieved, but after a little while, life goes on, and she ends up meeting a man named John. John is a nice, loving, merciful, kind, caring person in contrast to her former husband. She ends up getting married to John, and they live happily ever after. Going back to the Apostle Paul's analogy that he made, he says, you died to the law. In other words, you and Bill, the law, were married. One of you dies so that you are now free from that law of marriage. And it's broken. It's over. It's term That marriage is completely and absolutely over because one of you died. Then you can go over here and marry Jesus, the man of your dreams, loving, kind, forgiving, merciful, and all these wonderful qualities. That is the whole analogy scenario the Apostle Paul is painting, that if you want to be married to the law and you want to be married to Jesus Christ at the exact same time, you are living in spiritual adultery and guilty before the eyes of God as having more than one husband at the exact same time. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, Paul said, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Notice that. I have espoused you. The word espoused is G718 harmazo, which means indicates a father's betrothing his daughter to a man to join in wedlock. What the Apostle Paul is saying is that through the gospel plan of salvation, through you becoming a born-again Christian, I have actually engaged you to or betrothed you to Jesus Christ. Not the law, 
because you actually died to the law through the gospel plan of salvation, as we'll see in a bit. The point I'm trying to make right here is the Apostle Paul has betrothed or engaged you to Jesus Christ himself. Now, why is this important? You may remember the story of Joseph and Mary in the Bible and how Mary became pregnant with the child Jesus Christ. And in that process, when Joseph figured out that she was already pregnant, he wanted to give her a bill of divorcement. In that day and time in which Paul is writing, when a man and a woman got engaged to be married, at the engagement, at the betrothal, they were legally and lawfully for all intents and purposes already married at that moment. Although they are not going to come together and consummate the marriage and conjugal rights, they are still legally married, which is why Joseph was going to seek to give a bill of divorcement because Joseph and Mary were technically married although not in a physical relationship. Tying it into this verse in Paul's analogy, because you are espoused or betrothed to Jesus Christ, you are already legally married to him. Therefore, if you are trying to be married to another, in his analogy, the law, then you are already living in spiritual adultery and guilty of adultery before God Almighty. Now let's go back through some of these verses because I want to dig into them deeper and bring in some Greek. Going back to Romans chapter 7, verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Those words for law right there is G3551, nomos, which means law, regulation, statute, ordinance, custom, or command. So you can see that this word nomos is the word for law. But let's focus on that phrase, hath dominion over. In other words, the law hath dominion over a man only as long as he is alive. That phrase, hath dominion over, is G2961, koriuo, which means to have or exercise rule or authority over, to rule, to be lord of, exercise lordship over, have dominion over. In other words, as long as a person is alive, they are under the dominion and rulership of the law. That's going to be very important as we go forward. Now let's go to Romans chapter 6, verse 9, because I want to give you some context of how this word is used. It says, Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. Hath no more dominion over is G2961, meaning to exercise rule over or have authority over or to be lord of. Romans chapter 6, verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What did it say? Sin will not have dominion over you, control, authority, and power over you. Why? Because you are not under the law, not under nomos. But instead of being under law, you're under grace. Now, let me jump in here just for a moment because... In discussing this, there will be some people who say, well, what that's saying is you are not under the penalty and the judgment and the cursing of breaking the law anymore. You're not under sin judgment anymore. And the analogy that Paul uses in the context of a marriage relationship, not in the judgment of breaking a marriage relationship, it is in the marriage covenant itself. So when the Apostle Paul is saying that the law has no more dominion over you and sin has no more dominion over you is because you died to that marriage relationship so that you are totally and absolutely free from the covenant, not just the penalty of the covenant, but actually free from that husband totally and independently removed from that relationship. That's Paul's whole point. Let's go on to verse 2. 
For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Again, the word for law there, G3551, nomos. So if you are married, you're bound by law to the spouse. The word for bound there is G1210 deo, which means to bind or fasten with chains, to throw into chains, put under obligation of the law or duty. The point being is that if a person is married, there are certain laws that bind them together, tie them together with chains, and they're bound together one to another. But one way that you can be free from all of those laws is that one of the spouses die. And when one of them die, either or, they are free from all of the laws that that marriage entailed. And they're free to go and do whatever they want with the rest of their life because the marriage law has been broken by death. Verse three, so then, or however, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she is called an adulteress. Why? because she's trying to be married to two men at the exact same time. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, that nomos, so that she is no adulteress, though she's married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law, nomos, by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. Going to verse 5, for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, nomos, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, delivered from nomos, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. That phrase, we are delivered is G2673, cardageo, which means to abolish, cease, deliver, do away, loose, bring to naught, render useless, vanish away, make void. The word held is G2722, cateco, which means held fast, restrained, in firm possession of, detained, seized, held, possessed. It is not saying that it abolished the entire law and the law no longer applies to anybody anywhere. It is saying that the chains that were binding and tying you together to the law have been destroyed, broken, terminated, abolished. And the marriage covenant relationship that you had has been completely severed and now you can go be married to another, which is why Paul espoused you unto one, Jesus Christ, so he can present you as a chaste virgin unto Christ, so you are free. The marriage covenant law that you had tied, that kept you bound and held to the law of Moses, whatever it was, has now been broken and loosed, and you are free to go marry another one, which is Jesus Christ, which is leading you to ask the question, well, then what laws am I free from? Are you talking about the entire Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and the 613 commandments of Moses' law? Or are you talking about the Ten Commandments? Are you talking about the feast and the festival days and Sabbath days and what are you talking about, Brother Theo? Well, I am glad you asked because the Bible gives you the answer. Going to the very next verse, let's see what the Apostle Paul said. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Did you see that? I had not known lust except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So right here, we are in Romans chapter 7, verse 7. 
at a few verses above that in Romans 7 and 1, 2, 3, and 4, the Apostle Paul is talking about you being married to the law. At the exact same time, you're trying to be married to Jesus. What law is he talking about? He is talking about the Ten Commandments. He is talking about the entire Sinai Covenant. The Ten Commandments, written by the finger of God, written on tables of stone, was ratified by the blood of bulls and goats, which could not take away sins, and it was the blood that ratified the entire Mount Sinai Covenant. Everything, every bit of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy was all ratified on Mount Sinai by the blood of bulls and goats. Here, the Apostle Paul says, if you are trying to be married to the Ten Commandments at the exact same time you're being married to Jesus, you are in spiritual adultery. And not only that, but we've got other scriptures that I'll bring in to show you exactly what I'm talking about. Looking at Romans chapter 2, verse 21, Thou for which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Notice all of that. What law is the Apostle Paul talking about? Is he talking about clean and unclean animals? Is he talking about feast and festival days? Is he talking about sacrificing bulls, cows, goats, and sheep? Is he talking about two different kinds of fabric in your clothes and Sabbath days and leprosy and civil disobedience? He is talking about the Ten Commandments. Let's look at Romans 13 and 9. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. The point I'm trying to make through this is that the Apostle Paul makes emphatically clear that he is talking about the flagship, the pinnacle, the premier, the number one law of all, the Ten Commandments, that were written by the finger of God in tables of stone. And the Apostle Paul is addressing all the law. And he says, if you are trying to be married in a relationship, keeping the Ten Commandments, and trying to be married to Jesus Christ as a Christian at the same time, then you are living in spiritual adultery. Now, let me explain something, because I know some of you will be raising all kinds of questions. Hold on. It did not say that the first husband died. He ended up saying that you, the woman, died. In other words, the first husband is going to live forever because there's going to be millions and billions of people that are still going to come and go, and they are all going to be married to the first husband. However, as a Christian born-again believer, you died to the law. The marriage covenant and chains that bound y'all together, bound you to the law, the Ten Commandments, the law of Torah, all of it, you died in Jesus Christ, and that law that held y'all together was broken, and now you are free so that you can be a spouse, betrothed, and married to another, that is Jesus Christ. Which leads up to something very important. And that is, well then, how do I die to the law? How do I die to the obligations of marriage that restrain, confine, and tie me to the law? How do I break those chains of marriage that make the law my governing Lord, ruler, and the authority that controls my life. How do I break it? I got good news. The Apostle Paul gives you the answer. When you back up one chapter to Romans chapter 6, and we'll start at verse 3. It says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. And this goes back to what the Apostle Paul later reiterated in Romans chapter 7. The law did not die. 
You died to the law. How did you die to the law? You died to the law and broke that chain that held y'all together. You actually died to the law by being baptized in water in Jesus' name. Going on to verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That word for buried is G4916, suthopto, which means to bury together with. In other words, to be buried with someone. And this actually ties into Colossians chapter 2. For in him, that's talking about Jesus, for in Jesus dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism. Watch this. Because the Apostle Paul jumps right down a few verses here from water baptism in verse 16. And he says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. This verse says, therefore. That word therefore is very important because it means in light of everything that he had just said above that where he is talking about baptism in Jesus' name and being buried in water with Jesus in baptism. And because of that, therefore, because of all those things, you don't need to let anybody judge you in holy days, in festival days, in Sabbaths, new moons, none of it. Why? Because you died to the law. And then he goes right on in the next verse, verse 17, and says, by the way, all of those things were just a shadow of Jesus Christ. His point is, you don't need to worry about the feast and the festival days anymore. You don't need to worry about the Sabbath and the kosher laws of clean and unclean foods anymore. All of those things were a shadow leading up to Jesus Christ. But now that Jesus Christ is here, you have died with Jesus in water baptism to break the chain of tying you to the Old Testament laws, and you have now been completely freed, and you have become a new creature in Christ Jesus. And old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Another thing that I must cover from the Apostle Paul is in Galatians chapter 4, starting at verse 21. Tell me ye that desire to be under law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things were an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Then he drops down in verse 30 and says, Nevertheless, what saith the Scriptures? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, ye are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. The Apostle Paul is trying to emphatically let you know beyond a shadow of a doubt the entire law from Mount Sinai including the Ten Commandments, including the 613 commandments of Moses' law, the Torah, the Torah. All of it is the Mount Sinai covenant ratified by the blood of bulls and goats. And it is Hagar, for example, in the flesh. And he says, you are to cast it out and throw it away because it no longer applies to you. Why? Because you are a born-again Christian by faith in Jesus, and you are now in a covenant of promise by faith. You have broken the covenant that tied you to the law. The Ten Commandments did not die. You died to the Ten Commandments so that you could be free to marry another. So what you need to do is throw away the bondwoman. 
Brother Theo, do I need to keep the kosher food laws? No, you need to discard them and throw them away. If you want to keep them for your health, then keep it for your health, but it's a diet, not because of a religious reason or a spiritual reason. Brother Theo, do I need to keep the feast and the festival days and all these things from the Old Testament law? Not for any spiritual or religious reason whatsoever. Now, if you want to keep them as some kind of thing that you're just doing, that's permissible according to the scriptures, but don't you do it as obedience, religion, spiritual, or anything else. In fact, I would tell you, you just need to get over in the New Testament and follow the gospel plan of salvation and obey the epistles and what the epistles are telling you to do. Romans chapter 10 and 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. That word for end right there where it says Christ is the end of the law of righteousness End is G5056 telos, which means end, completion, conclusion, consummation, termination, closing act, perfect discharge, fulfillment, realization, final dealing. That by which a thing is finished. The end of some act or state, but not the end of a period of time. What is this verse saying? This verse is again driving home that if you are a born again Christian, baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, that you have come out of the law. And in Jesus Christ, the end, Jesus is the end of the law of righteousness. What was the law of righteousness? The Bible makes it emphatically clear it's the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, and all that Mount Sinai law. That was the law of righteousness. But in Jesus, it has an end for you. And you now keep the commandments of Jesus. You now keep the law of Christ. You now keep the law of faith, liberty, grace, the law of doing good, and all these other things that we are required to do for Jesus. We are not without law. We are not without commandment. We are not without restraint. We take our orders from the epistles and the New Testament, which may in fact cl complete many of the things from the Old Testament. But the Old Testament is not telling us what to do. The New Testament is telling us what to do. Now, I want to cover something very important, which is a passage that many people do not even know what it means. And I've been asked what this means. Well, it fits perfect in this lesson. And that is in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4. It says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing that they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. A lot of people ask me, Brother Theo, what is this scripture saying? Well, I've got news for you. It ties in perfectly with this message because what this passage is actually saying is once a person has followed the gospel plan of salvation, being born again in Jesus' name of water, water baptized, and being filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with the Spirit of God, that it is impossible. Once you go back to the Old Testament, once you go back to the Old Covenant, there remains no more sacrifice for you because now you are abandoning your husband, Jesus Christ, in the New Covenant, and you are trying to go back to an Old Covenant ratified in the blood of bulls and goats and there is no more remission of sins for you. There is no more sacrifice for you because that system has been done away with for born-again Christian believers. If you try to go back to Sabbath days, if you try to go back to feast days, you are actually going backwards and you are uncrucifying Jesus Christ for you, and it will be impossible for you to be saved going back to the Old Covenant if you have been born again in the New Covenant. And something that is beautiful is Romans 8 and 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, 
who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now this is beautiful, but why is it beautiful? It says there's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Wait a minute, hold on. How did you get free in Jesus that there's therefore now no condemnation? Because we just saw in Romans chapter 6 that you died with Jesus in water baptism. And in Romans 7, we see that when you died in water baptism, the law of marriage that tied you to the Old Testament law has been severed and broken, and you are now a new creature, free to be married to another. You have been betrothed to Jesus Christ, and because you died in water baptism and free from the law, because you've been married to another, that is Jesus Christ, because of that, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, which is why it is important for you to get baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost because it's how you become a born-again Christian, born of water and born of the Spirit. You need water baptism and you need Holy Ghost to be delivered from the law. Here's my takeaway for you out of this video. The Apostle Paul gives an analogy of marriage, and it turns out that the story of the woman trying to be married to two husbands at the same time, the woman is you. And the first husband is the law, the Mount Sinai law, consisting of the 613 commandments of Moses, and consisting of the Ten Commandments, the whole Mount Sinai Covenant. The second husband is none other than Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says that you died to the law. The law did not die because the Ten Commandments still have to stand forever and always defining what sin is. And some people may satisfy it by conscience, but still the Ten Commandments are the golden rule that tell us right from wrong. When you become a born-again Christian, born of water and born of the Spirit, you die to the law. How do you die to the law? The chains that bound you together in a marriage covenant, in a marriage contract, when you die in water baptism, that is broken because you die in the likeness of Jesus Christ, and you literally become a brand new creature. The old Jew is passed away, and all things are become new. And in the likeness of Jesus Christ, you are raised up as a new creature, a new person, a new beginning, and the old marriage that you had to the law is forever broken. And you can now be espoused or betrothed to Jesus Christ as a chaste virgin unto Jesus Christ. Now, here's the deal. When you are betrothed to another husband, Jesus Christ, in the new covenant, if you try to go back to your first husband and be married at the same time, you are living in adultery, which means if you are a born-again Christian, married to Jesus, and you try to keep the law you are living in spiritual adultery and guilty before God of adultery. How do you die to the law? You do it through Jesus' name, water baptism. If you have not seen my videos on water baptism, please go see them because I explain this. Peter was baptized in Jesus' name. All the disciples were baptized in Jesus' name. The apostle Paul himself was baptized in Jesus' name. The Samaritans were baptized in Jesus' name. The Gentiles were baptized in Jesus' name. They all received the Spirit of God, evidenced by speaking in tongues. That's how you become a born-again Christian, and that is how you die to the law. Amen. God bless you. I pray this video was a blessing to you and empowered you in some way. Until next time, you pray for me. And I'll be praying for you. God bless you. I love you. And I can't wait to see you next time. I love you. Bye-bye.